heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow is off. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the U.S. awards TSMC $11.6 billion in grants and loans in an effort to boost that domestic semiconductor manufacturing. We'll break down what the move means for the U.S. chip production. Plus, in his annual letter to shareholders, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon likens artificial intelligence to the invention of the steam engine. We'll discuss his views on how the technology is changing the world and his workforce. And blue checks, they're back. And Elon Musk's X, the social platform, makes a U-turn as it offers premium features to popular accounts for free. That says Musk takes on Brazilian court leaders. Details on that and so much more throughout this hour, but focus on the public markets. As we look towards CPI print coming on Wednesday, all eyes focus on what the bond market is doing. Yields actually currently up three basis points. And in fact, we're seeing the highest levels for the entirety of this year. But it's not pulling back on any sort of risk taking in the equity market thus far. We still see the Nasdaq pushing up some five tenths of a percent. So keep an eye on some of the key names that are driving us higher, even as bond markets do still worry about basically inflationary pressures and what that means for the Federal Reserve and the likelihood of a cut coming throughout the rest of the year. Bitcoin still charging to new highs. We're at 3.5 percent higher. 71,756, so we're back at near those all-time highs. Move on, some of the other risk assets to the individual names that are on the move and the individual benchmarks. Tesla, best performer on the Nasdaq 100. We're up 5%. Now, remember, this is a beaten-up stock, worst performer on the S&P 500 so far this year. And Elon Musk trying to switch the narrative here, trying to move from the worries about ultimately deliveries being weak, even a concern about the cheaper models, and instead wants us to focus on robo-taxis and whether or not that big unveil will be enough to boost the stock coming on August the 8th, so exactly four months' time. I'm looking at Amazon encroaching on all record highs. We're up one percentage point, 187, as yet more desire to be getting into this stock pushes this name higher. I'm looking, though, at the key story of the day, and this is where we've got to drill in for. TSMC, of course, Taiwanese semiconductor giant, getting $11.6 billion in grants and loans to be putting its third fab in Phoenix, Arizona. This is all about the latest infrastructure play to ensure that we've got domestic chips made here in the United States that are going to be the underpinning of artificial intelligence. This stock is up 2.25% on the ADRs. What does that mean for the broader ecosystem? I'm pleased to say Advisors Capital Management Partner and Portfolio Manager Joanne Feeney joins us with your expertise in the chip making field. And Joanne, how important is it that we get foreign expertise into the US to, con to continue with a supply chain that has proven to be broken on, re on previous mines of, what, two or three years ago? Yeah, Caroline, good morning. You know, the value to the U.S. of having more domestic manufacturing at the leading edge or close to the leading edge of, of semiconductors is, is strategically pretty important, right? We are all looking at geopolitical instabilities and risks, particularly in the Asia Pacific. And so this builds on Taiwan Semi's ability to spread their manufacturing around the world. They already have announced plans in Japan and Germany for lagging edge manufacturing. They already have operations here in the U.S., but really, really limited. This will bring to the U.S. Uh, a significant uh, portion of uh, some manufacturing close to the leading edge by the time it's done. And, and that'll, be, that'll help stabilize things. It also de-risks Taiwan Semi a little bit for investors. Okay. De-risk to a certain degree. What's been interesting is other companies, when coming into the United States, wanting to boost their manufacturing, have worried about their limitation on labor. Have we got the right, ultimately, rest of the joined-up approach here? Yes, you can get the money, you can get the grants and the loans, but if you've got the talent pool... Yeah, it's a real challenge. So when I was working up at Albany Nanotech as part of the team there that was trying to bring manufacturing to upstate New York, and there wasn't much beyond IBM in the Hudson Valley, we had to invest in the local industrial infrastructure, if you like, not just labor, but also machine shops and, and other support to a fabrication facility. Intel is going to face those challenges in Ohio because there's very little infrastructure there in this area. Mm. Taiwan Semi at least already has plenty of operations in Phoenix, and they're going to have to do more. And so training programs in conjunction with local technical colleges and community colleges help to create that funnel. Fortunately, chip fabrication plants tend to be very capital intensive. It's not a lot of labor 
that ends up getting hired here. So these subsidies aren't really about creating jobs, although you'll hear other politicians say that. Probably most of the jobs are in the construction of the plant itself. Once the plant is up and running, you know, maybe a thousand or two people. So it's not a huge number. And I know people are focused on this concern about labor, but we do have great engineering schools in this country. Yeah. And once the job opportunities are there, you tend to see more kids flow into those programs. Plus you add in the customized training programs from the companies. Okay, so the companies, we, when we think of TSMC being one that is really making the most of subsidies, loans, grants being offered, so too is Intel as well. And I'm just interested as to how much you think this money, this chips act, will be filtering into foreign entities or indeed more, more local U.S. presence. Well, you know, the leading edge in manufacturing, unfortunately, for the U.S. companies has been taken over by Taiwan Semi and Samsung. Uh, mm -hmm. Intel had made some mistakes in their uh, planning for uh, manufacturing design. They, they chose a path that ultimately didn't, didn't work out very well. And now Pat Gelsinger is trying to shift that path to, to the more modern alternative. And it's going to take them some years and it's going to be costly. So in terms of the US strategic goal of creating more supply of chip manufacturing in this country, we have no choice but to include foreign companies like Taiwan Semi and Samsung. We will see if Intel ultimately is successful in bringing their manufacturing up to snuff. But right now, uh, they're trailing edge. Move it on and consider for us, Joanne, ultimately whether or not you say it takes some of the risk out for investors. Does it really take the risk out of supply chain concerns going into the next 10, 20 years that we've seen that hit so hard during COVID? No. Uh, Caroline, I think you asked that question deliberately <laughs> to get a no answer. I mean, there is just a global uh, integration of manufacturing, not just in chips, uh, but, you know, as we saw during COVID, also in, uh, in protective clothing and devices. And we don't ever really want to undo that. Um, we value incredibly and benefit incredibly from uh, trade and having countries specialize in manufacturing the things that uh, their comparative advantage favors. And, and we get cheaper goods because of it. Consumers benefit around the world because of that, uh, that, that separation of, of production by specialty. So we don't ever want to undo trade flows, right? But what we want to do is shore up the infrastructure of politics and economics, uh, hopefully to, to keep disruptions uh, to supply chains as low as we can. Now, obviously, COVID or something like that, another pandemic comes along and we're going to have problems. And so mm. we have tried to onshore more production of critical items. And that's what the CHIPS Act is all about. What's been interesting is there's been, for example, Bloomberg Intelligence saying, look, ASML, chip equipment maker, is likely to be another key player that benefits from some of the grants, the loans, the, the support, the subsidies that the U.S. government currently has. Any other key players that come to mind? Well, yeah, I think that's right to point out the equipment guys. The more chip fabrication facilities that are built, the better it is for LAM research, for applied materials, for ASML, KLA, you know, all the chip guys and all the gas suppliers and the the other smaller equipment suppliers like, say, uh, Avico Instruments, you know, there's a lot of beneficiaries. This is a very large industry. Um, and, and so it's pretty broad. Um, and also the, the companies that use these manufacturers, NVIDIA, AMD, Apple, they all benefit by having a source of supply that's more globally diversified and therefore less subject to geopolitical risks. We always love having your perspective and clarity of thought and your nose when they're necessary. Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management, thank you so much for joining us Monday. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to be breaking down Jamie Dimon's annual letter to shareholders as he discusses, you guessed it, artificial intelligence. Details next. Meanwhile, talking of the beneficiaries of artificial intelligence, where has a real lockup on some of the infrastructure plays? Well, this Japanese name, Tower, is up 400% of late. Why? Because it really does define chip equipment making, chips in and of themselves, how you ensure you've got the right resin in place, how you ensure you're making your chips tower, a key Japanese name you've got to keep an eye on. Look, it's off by three tenths percent on the day, but what a run up we've had. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology.
Jamie Dimon's annual letter to shareholders out and guess what the focus is? Artificial intelligence. We want to dig in as to why he's once again calling this out in his letter with Shanali Basak of Bloomberg News. 2017 was the first time he mentioned artificial intelligence in his share letter but this time it is the key driver of the entire letter it feels like. Yeah it is the scale and the scope at which he mentions it that is different from prior years but to your point he has mentioned it a lot before and certainly we know that JP Morgan has invested a lot of money in this. So what is different this time around? The scale at which they're using it, the use cases have jumped from about 300 use cases a year ago to about 400 now. And importantly also, the number of data scientists and machine learning experts have also been rising over at JP Morgan. Interestingly enough, last year when he mentioned artificial intelligence, it was one of the specific issues, but it was still behind climate. Okay. And this time he listed this as the first and foremost issue uh, for JP Morgan ahead. I mean, just to put a finer detail on it, what was it, 2,000 machine learning and AI data experts that they've got hired, and also an, an admission that the talent pool is going to have to change. He's willing to say there will be jobs lost. Absolutely, and also that the ones that are not lost will have to be retrained. Mm. He's pretty specific about that. In addition to the jobs, I think the investment that's being made is also very interesting, Caroline. Remember, they have invested about $2 billion to build new data centers, and he sees this movement to the cloud as inextricably linked to the AI revolution, if you will, and he has said that this movement towards AI in the society at large is as revolutionary Revolutionary as the steam engine or the advent of the internet. And so data centers are really interesting here for yeah. JP Morgan. About 30% last year of their applications had moved to the cloud. By the end of this year, it'll be 70%. So that transformation is pretty drastic when you look at just a year over year change for JP Morgan. Yeah, because I think we like to focus in on the fact that Jamie Dimon's been there saying, look, your kids will only have three and a half day work weeks. They will be cancer free because of this AI technology. But he does then go into cloud. He does just go into technology more broadly. Yeah, he, he certainly does. In a few different ways. It's splattered throughout the entirety of the annual letter. He talks about it in terms of J.P. Morgan's own investment. And I think interestingly as well, he talks about this year over year as well, but the competitive set, not just from fintech, but from the likes of Apple. And the language also gets more pronounced as you go on, whereas last year he kind of brings up Apple Pay and Apple Card, certain services for Apple. This year he says it holds money, it moves money, it lends money, and so on. It effectively acts as a bank, and he brings this up in the vein of regulation and all the players that are not facing regulation right. in technology and financial services. So it just kind of underscores here his intensity to not only keep up but change J.P. Morgan as we look ahead. And maybe you'd say the close runner to his talk about technology is his, well, less than guarded approach to regulators throughout the entirety of the letter too. We thank you so much, Shanali Basek, always able to jump on this news flow with us. We thank her for it. Meanwhile, look, let's just stick on the markets. Let's stick on artificial intelligence dominating these markets a little bit more. Janet Murray is with us, RBC Bruin Dolphin, Head of Market Analysis. And look, we have seen markets continue to be near record highs, whether it's the S&P 500, whether it's the NASDAQ. And are you anticipating that remains the case, Janet, even as we worry about a CPI print, for example, here in the US? Hi, uh, Caroline. Thanks for having me. So we believe that this uh, equity bull market led by artificial intelligence will continue, even though you know there might be bumpy inflation data along the way. We have already seen how the market has performed despite higher bond yields and despite uh, central bankers being, being less dovish recently. So I think there are more secular and mega trend factors that is driving the equity market rally there. I think as long as inflation is not outrageous, it's, there's no shock. I think as long as bond yields remain uh, pretty stabilized, I think the market uh, rally can continue. Does it broaden though? There's a really interesting piece out on the Bloomberg today just showing how Wall Street at the moment is trying to find a different way of playing the AI optimism. Yes, you've already put your money into NVIDIA and it's up another 70% year to date. It was up 200% or more than last year. But what about some of the emerging market players? What about the infrastructure to be had elsewhere? We we're just showing a Japanese name, Tower, that's done particularly well. Well, absolutely. So we actually favor a basket of uh, exposure to semiconductor uh, equipment makers uh, related names. So of course, NVIDIA would be the dominant player. But equally, we think there is plenty of opportunities across the entire semiconductor value chain. So I think uh, some of the other players, for example, in uh, memories, in infrastructure, in intellectual property, they may not 
yet uh, have the you know, uh, recognition of significant rally like NVIDIA, but you know, there are plenty of opportunities. So um, we, we feel that it perhaps is a good way to play it via an uh, equal weight basket of uh, stocks exposed to that theme rather than just, you know, being a few selected stocks, for instance. It's interesting. You mentioned NVIDIA and a lot of some of the risk in amid the exuberance around that name has been its relationship to China. The fact that ultimately it depends on China as an end market and, of course, in manufacturing as well. How much do you think geopolitical headwinds are going to be something that we need to consider a bit more in the second half of the year? Well, we always need to consider geopolitical factors. But I do think that in that case, U.S. stocks are likely to outperform uh, the ex-U.S. regions if you talk about uh, AI stocks, uh, for instance. Because I think, um, as, as we all seen already, there are plenty of subsidies, uh, loans and grants for companies to actually produce in America. So the entire you know, value chain may shift more and more to America. So I, I do think that the American companies may be less impacted by these geopolitical risks. And obviously, uh, the China play, we, we're not you know, very, very interested in that. I think some of the EM plays may also be more at risk uh, if there are more talks of, of trade tensions and geopolitical tensions. But I do think U.S. stocks should be better in these circumstances. RBC Ruin Dolphin, Head of Market Analysis, generally. It's always great to catch up with you on the show and your global perspective. We thank you for it. Well, look, we're going to go a little bit more global in a moment. We have a conversation on cybersecurity with the former Chief of Staff of Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, that's CISA, Kirsten Todd. What she's seeing about concerns relating to Microsoft and ultimate exposure to China. That's up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time now for Talking Tech. First up, Paddy Cosgrove. Well, he's returning to the Web Summit Tech Conference. The news comes after he resigned, remember, back in October of last year, after he made a political statement on the conflict between Israel and Hamas following the October the 7th terrorist attacks. Cosgrove, the co-founder of the Web Summit Tech Conference, confirmed the news on X that he is returning to his role as CEO. Plus, as AI demand quickens, Alibaba is slashing the cloud prices globally to fend off rivals and revive growth. Now, the move comes amid a surge in demand for cloud computing to support a global boom in AI development, as well as some pretty complicated internal restructuring. And some key lawmakers have struck a deal on national data privacy here in the United States. The landmark agreement reached by the House Energy and Commerce Chair and the Senate Commerce Chair would be the first time established federal consumer data privacy rights would be formed and, and allow Americans to sue companies such as Google and Meta over violations. Meanwhile, look, the Department of Homeland Security's Cyber Safety Review Board has been out with a report on Microsoft that was pretty damning. It assessed the Microsoft Exchange online intrusion that occurred in May and June of 2023. Let's dig into what that report showed, the limitations, and overall, the cybersecurity space as it sits right now. Former Chief of Staff of Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Kirsten Todd, is with us. And currently serving as the president of Wondros. It is great to have some time with you, Kirsten. And we don't want to sort of overlook this. It came at the beginning of last week, but it almost sort of highlighted 101 cybersecurity etiquette that seemed to have been failed over at Microsoft. Can you just detail a little bit about what you thought about the report? Sure. So the Cyber Safety Review Board, uh, it was launched in 21 and it was really executed in 2022. This was the third investigation that it conducted. And last uh, August, the Secretary of Homeland Security said that the review board was going to look into this intrusion that occurred, as you said, in May and June. And what it found most specifically was that the intrusion was preventable and should have never occurred. The intrusion itself hacked into the email systems of over 500 individuals and 22 organizations, but specifically it hacked into the email of the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, and uh, the U.S. Ambassador to China, Nick Burns, prior to an official visit to China. And what the review board attributed this, uh, this breach uh, that should have been preventable to was the fact that it identified Microsoft as having poor security practices, a lack of transparency into the breach, and a lax uh, corporate culture when it comes to cybersecurity. 
And we've got to remember sort of the frustrations that Gina Raimondo, Commerce Secretary, has shown in particular of a trip to China and what was ultimately unfurled by China at the same time, just the Huawei phone that was suddenly presented and everyone realizing this moment that perhaps some of the limitations on tech from US to China perhaps isn't doing the job that many had thought. I'm interested in the threat actor known as Storm 0558. That seems to have been what's at play here, but how much should Microsoft have been able to prevent all of this and, and how or how many other risks are they overcoming on a day-to-day -day basis? We're shouting out one particular failing, but how often are they achieving what they determined to do? Well, this is the big concern um, because we continue to see these types of breaches uh, happening from Microsoft vulnerabilities. And I have a former colleague at CISA who talks about the fact that we say vulnerabilities, but in fact, they're, uh, they're defects. When you prioritize adding features over security, this vulnerability of infrastructure uh, only increases. And the challenge really, be, this is a national security risk mm. because Microsoft is ubiquitous across the federal government. It is one of the largest, if not the largest technical uh, technology company in the world. But importantly, the US federal government has its essential services underpinned by Microsoft, Microsoft technology. And importantly, these are the services that support national security. So when there are vulnerabilities in the Microsoft system, that translates onto our national security safety. Are they much worse than others? Well, I think what was interesting about this report is uh, early on when the investigation initiated, uh, Microsoft said, let's make this a cloud service provider investigation. And the report did that. And it talked about the other companies, Amazon, Google, uh, Oracle, all having better security practices. But I think the key piece here is this isn't necessarily a commercial competitiveness issue other than government looking at options. But in the very near term, this is a national security issue because we've got to be paying attention to the resilience and the safety and security of our infrastructure, which is underpinned by technology that's created in the private sector. And I think you know one of the most telling pieces was last October, uh, the directors of intelligence from the five eyes, which are the countries New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the UK and the US, came together in Silicon Valley in an unprecedented meeting to meet with the CEOs of those technology companies to say, we have a real threat from China and you may not have built your company as a national security company, but your technology is now part of the national security of this country. Kirsten, Todd, it's so great to get your expertise across this. Thank you for, well, reminding us why it's also crucial. President of Wondros, we thank you. Meanwhile, coming up, X makes a U-turn on verification as it rolls out some premium features for free to popular users. Details of that come next. Meanwhile, let's look at the rest of, well, the companies that are dominated by one Elon Musk. We're currently up some almost 6% on Tesla. Now, it's poised to recover its top position, it looks like, over at Cathie Wood's main fund. That's as her firm has just been buying the dip in these shares of the electric vehicle maker. Remember, this is the worst performing name on the S&P 500 so far this year. We're up 5.8% also as they start to articulate a vision for robo-taxis, one of the key reasons that, of course, ARK has been so long this name for so many years. This is Bloomberg Technology. Apple has another new next big thing under exploration, home robots. The company has teams within its AI and hardware engineering organizations exploring the feasibility of bringing robotics driven devices to market. The company is testing a tabletop device that uses a robotic arm to move around an iPad display. For instance, if a user is on a FaceTime call, the screen can move to mimic the head movements like a nod or the turn of a head as the person on the other end of the call. The more interesting product under consideration is a home robot similar to the Amazon Astro that can follow a user around their home. Some ideas for that include video conferencing as well as a pie in the sky ambition for the robot to be able to conduct household chores such as cleaning dishes before they go in a dishwasher. Any release is probably many years away if it happens at all. I'm Mark Gurman. This is Bloomberg. Meanwhile, let's get a check in on these markets because overall we are seeing equity markets managing to drift higher. NASDAQ 100 up a tenth of percent. We're coming off of our highs though, and that might be in the face of 
borrowing costs that continue to rise on the bond market. We're seeing two-year yields up another three basis points, let's call it, 4.77. We're also seeing the 10-year yield up at the highest since November of last year. Why? We're worried about inflationary pressure, and we'll be getting yet more data later in the week on Wednesday, the CPI print, many bracing for, and what that means for the Federal Reserve. Bitcoin, though, I mean, shaking off any concerns with the bond market, a risk asset up another 3.3%, again, off of recent highs, but we're 71,668 managing to rally through the weekend. Move on to some of the individual names that we've been keeping a close eye on. And, well, TSMC has got to be a key name if you're trading the American depository receipts, that is. We're higher on the day. Why? $11.6 billion coming in grants and loans for this particular chip maker to be building yet further fab units, a third one in Phoenix, Arizona, all of about the supply chain here in the United States. ASML could be a key winner in this particular area as well. Bloomberg Intelligence out with a great note saying, look, ASML, a chip equipment maker, based over in the Netherlands, could well be doing well from the Chips Act over here in the United States. We're up a percentage point. And Tesla, best performer on the Nasdaq 100 today. We're up more than 5%. Now, all of this as we see perhaps a focus more reorientating on robo-taxis. Tesla CEO Elon Musk saying that the EV maker will unveil its long-promised robo-taxi on August the 8th, exactly four months from now. Look, that's years after first hinting at plans for a dedicated robo-taxi back in 2019. Shares of Tesla were, as we see, rallying on this news after the announcement, even as the company has recently been struggling with well, look, weak sales, competition from cheap Chinese electric vehicles, plenty of concerns that have pushed this share lower throughout the course of 2024. But let's just switch gears and look at what else Elon Musk has been focused on of late, because, of course, X is one of them. And the blue verification check mark on X has been reserved, of course, to paid subscribers since Musk overhauled the social platform up until now. Because Musk recently decided to grant the status marker for free to those with enough followers, which is roughly what it was like previously. But because of what it has become, some qualifying users now sound mm, a little embarrassed to have a blue check mark back, and they want their followers to know that they are not paying for it. We're pleased to welcome Bloomberg's Austin Carr to the show, who's just been writing about this in the Daily Newsletter. And Austin, just give us some of the anecdotal evidence that people are a bit worried about looking as though they paid for a blue check mark. You know, in recent days, we've seen a lot of these uh, very high profile users who were not paying Twitter and in fact had their blue check mark revoked by Elon 18 months ago, suddenly seeing that verification status appear in their profiles again. And you see a lot of them tweeting saying, number one, I did not pay for this. <laughs> and number two, uh, I want to turn it off. Um, you see there is an option within the settings menu. So you saw some uh, like the high profile uh, uh, producer of The Wire, David Simon. He was very much complaining. Uh, saying that he was not paying for this blue check mark, that he would never pay for it, he does not support Elon. And I think what this signals is that um, the blue check mark has gone from being a status of verification to being something a little bit more meaningless, if not devoid of value, uh, maybe overly politicized. It means something more than just this is your true identity and you are someone of note. Uh, it's really had this uh, sort of controversy installed, uh, embedded into that blue check mark since Elon took it over 18 months ago and promised to get rid of this, what he called a lords and peasants system of verification. Yet go back to, therefore, the change of heart for Elon Musk himself. What hasn't been working under the new system? Uh, so when he took it over about a year and a half ago, uh, he felt the process was corrupt. It was essentially given out to celebrities, politicians, uh, you know, other notable figures, uh, brands. And he just felt the process was, uh, you know, nonsensical, as he described it. He felt it was unclear who could get it and who could not. So when he took over, he revoked it in mass for a lot of very famous people, uh, which created a lot of chaos. Uh, and the way the system he replaced it with. Uh, it required you to pay for a premium subscription, at least $8, maybe $16 a month. And then you would go through a review process and get a blue check mark. The issue was all the people whose blue checks were removed did not sort of re-engage with the platform. They, they saw it as a sign of protest. They'd created so much content, so much engagement on the platform. And suddenly, you know, someone like LeBron James, he was saying, wait, I have to pay for my own blue check mark now. Um, and then on the reverse end, you saw a lot of people who supported Elon suddenly rushing to buy this blue check mark. And it almost became a symbol of what you, you, whether you were supporting what Elon was doing with Twitter or perhaps his worldview, his politics, his approach to free speech. And so it became overly politicized. And now, again, it really, I'm not quite sure what a blue check mark means if you have it in your po profile. Does it mean you are who you say you are or that you support Elon or you just like paying for Twitter? 
Let's just talk about Elon's commitment to free speech for a moment and the global aspect of it, Austin, because over in Brazil, it looks as though there has been a push by certain, well, judges over there to want to clamp down on the use of Twitter and X and certain voices to be heard on the platform. Now Elon Musk is saying he's lifting certain restrictions in Brazil, basically defying court orders over there. Can you give us sort of ultimately what's brought us to this moment? Sure. He, he has defied a court order um, and essentially reactivated certain accounts that the court had ordered banned. Uh, it's still early uh, in the details. We don't quite know what accounts have been reactivated. We don't know why they were ordered blocked. Uh, but a judge there has uh, apparently opened an inquiry into the matter, and they're looking into it forward. But I think what it boils down to, before we know all the details of how this happened and what the nature of these accounts uh, were, uh, it really uh, symbolizes Elon's so-called free speech uh, sort of pure, pure uh, purism. He sort mm -hmm. of presented himself as this free speech advocate that will do anything to promote uh, principles over profit, as he put it when he sort of said uh, on, on X that he was going to reactivate these accounts for the good of the uh, free speech. He would even leave Brazil, shut down their office, sacrifice their revenue if need be. Um, and that is definitely the brand that Elon tries to project. But we've also seen many sort of hypocritical uh, instances of this, especially in the U.S., where he's banned journalists, where he's essentially removed verification status once from The New York Times because he disagreed with some of the reporting. Um, and then in other instances, you know, there was a famous instance where Elon, uh, when people were uh, protesting uh, and trying to get ad supporters to block their support of, of Twitter, um, you know, he considered banning those uh, users, too, who are sort of trying to boycott the platform. And so we have this sort of tension point between Elon's uh, values uh, and, and, and X's business model, which has been really struggling to generate revenue since Elon acquired it. So you're seeing that play out in Brazil. And it's, it's a good question about why he's sort of standing up for these particular accounts um, and whether or not he will actually commit to that at the expense of uh, X's revenue down there. Probably lose all revenue in Brazil and have to shut down our office there, as he posted himself. Austin Carr, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed and a great newsletter you had out this morning. Meanwhile, coming up, the fight over diversity in corporate America continues. That's as DEI-related causes and cases, they keep piling up. We'll discuss all of this with Hello Alice co-founder Elizabeth Gore. That's next. Meanwhile, let's just keep a track on some globally traded stocks right now. Atos over in France, French IT company, pretty in battle to be honest. It's going to be presenting a debt restructuring plan today as the company's top shareholder one point seeks to build basically a coalition. They want to offer an alternative rescue plan for this particular name. It's been under pressure. Look at how the share price rallied over the course of the European trading day. This is Bloomberg Technology. Alice is a fintech startup offering grants, networking opportunities and access to finance for entrepreneurs from underrepresented groups in particular. It's just announced a new Series C funding round and now values the company at $130 million. Now this is despite being on the front lines of a litigation war over diversity in corporate America. Six months ago, it was hit with a lawsuit filed by the conservative activist group America First Legal, which has lodged at least six other DEI-related suits elsewhere. It claims a grant program by Hello Alice, co-run for black-owned small businesses, is discriminatory. Now, the startup has had to spend six figures on fees for three law firms so far. And we're going to dive into this ongoing legal battle and indeed, well, the ultimate growth of the business too. Hello Alice co-founder and president Elizabeth Gore is here with us. And this comes at a time where... The DEI discussion pendulum has swung significantly. Yes. And there is this view that people giving and allocating grants to people of color is in some way discriminating against mm -hmm. white founders. Mm -hmm. Now, how has that been a distraction for the business or actually has it been a galvanizing force? You know, it, I will just open with it's been a galvanizing force. Yeah. We just hit 1.5 million small businesses on the platform. And we serve everyone at Hello Alice. And with the five and a half million small businesses that are launching right now in this country, it is a great time to be in FinTech, we think. And we provide credit and loans, grants, and we've done 40 million in philanthropy and grants. And we're very proud that those have gone to women, people of color, US veterans, and white males. But we're capitalists at the end of the day. And we wanna make sure everyone are included in the small business ecosystem. It's critical. Have any of your user base 
any prospective clients ever brought this up? And they said, look, the fact that you're giving grants to minorities, mm -hmm. I feel discriminated mm -hmm. against. Uh, no. In fact, when we announced that uh, we were being sued, uh, we've had hundreds of thousands of letters of support, emails, people coming out. We're based in Houston, Texas, and we've got our vets coming out in support of African Americans. We have women coming out in support of men. The small business community, particularly after COVID, has really galvanized. They're growing. Now, capital's tight right now. I will give everyone that. But they're really a savvy community that they have to have each other. If you look at Main Street, all those shops are working together to scale everything we need in this country. So that support is there from everyone. We have never heard a complaint about it, ever. And so when you're fundraising out there, looking for a Series C, how mm -hmm. much are you having to talk to potential investors about the use of the money mm -hmm. for a business case or indeed for a legal case? Is there any point that having to be commingled? Well, sure. I mean, there was a lot of tension uh, when the case first came out. There was concern about the, the, quote, legitimacy of our business. And I'm here to say that we are now one of the fastest platforms for financial technology, offering credit and loans to small businesses. Um, we're about to be profitable, which is really exciting for a fintech. Um, but you have to disclose. A lawsuit's a lawsuit. And that's why we are, think that these are very distracting. We think they're a waste of money. Everything we've done is perfectly legal. And we want to make money for our investors. We want to make money for our small business owners. And I'm really happy to say, despite all this, we have significantly grown. It took investors a minute mm -hmm. to step back, be like, whoa, what is this? What, is this going to impact me? And they're capitalists at the end of the day. And our business is growing. We are making money. Our small businesses are. So no matter what, they came back in and funded us, and we just closed our Series C. So we're pretty stoked. So you remain committed to the philanthropic endeavors Absolutely. and the grants. Absolutely. What do you remain committed to in terms of your own technology? What are you doing and building there at the well, moment? Well, what's really exciting is the evolution of AI. My co-founder, Colin Rods, has really been on the forefront of that for a decade. And now that it is getting, I would say, cheaper to access great data, it allows us with our, we have a proprietary business health score that score small businesses' financial health from zero to 100 and gets them ready for that next step of funding. So that business health score is now being used not just by us, but everyone from Wells Fargo to Chase. So it's a great time for our business, and we're continuing to say that we are here for small business. We're going nowhere. Come back. Tell I'd us love how the to. legal dispute continues. We thank her for her time. Hello, Alice, co-founder, President Elizabeth Gore. Coming up, we're going to be joined around while well, some of the spats going on at board level surrounding Paramount. Rich Greenfield from Lightshed Partners is going to be breaking down what lies ahead for the business and indeed who could be buying it, whether it's the right course for investors. This is Bloomberg Technology. Tens of millions of Americans, they're gearing up to witness the solar eclipse today when the sun will become almost entirely covered by the moon. It's the first time in almost a century that the western and northern parts of New York State will experience a total eclipse. And though the entire event will last for several hours, the main spectacle, when day turns to night, is expected to last only about a four-minute period. And it will still be going to cost the U.S. 30 gigawatts of solar energy, the output of roughly 30 nuclear reactors. Meanwhile, let's shift gears. Movie producer David Ellison is in negotiations to take charge of Paramount. He and his backers have agreed to pay a little more than $2 billion to Sherry Redstone's National Amusements and the family company that controls Paramount. We want to break all of this down with someone who's been writing about it significantly, like Shed partner Rich Greenfield. And Sherry Redstone likes this offer from Ellison thinks that he can bring about new growth for the business in its entirety, not sell off assets to immediately. Rich, do you like this deal? Look, this is, um, first of all, we haven't seen exactly what the deal mm. looks like and what all of the different pieces are. But I think if you're the, you know, National Amusements, which is effectively, uh, Caroline, the Redstone family, they want an owner that is going to love the asset, take care of the asset, in much the way the Redstone family has taken care of the Paramount studio for decades. And I think that's one of the big attractions here is, you know, merging. Because, again, what this transaction actually is, it's not a sale. Uh, you know, National Amusements is selling their stake yes. um, to uh, Skydance. 
but it appears the rest of Skydance is being folded in. So essentially it's Paramount buying Skydance and Skydance taking over and having control uh, of overall Paramount. But this is not a sale. There, there was, you know, there it does not seem that National Amusements wants to sell the entirety of Paramount to private equity and mm. see the company broken up into pieces or sold for parts. That doesn't seem to be something they want. Remember, what I think a lot of investors forget is this is a controlled company. So just because public shareholders want something does not mean the company has to proceed down that path. That is the danger of a controlled company when yeah. you're investing. And if you don't like it, don't invest in controlled companies. Because ultimately you might end up with a slightly dilutive deal that leaves you slightly poorer. Ultimately, though, could what is the narrative that now needs to be built by Ellison or anyone else, the, the current board membership of Paramount, to say this will in the long term still reap you benefits? Well, again, if, if your control shareholder doesn't want to sell the entire company, then you really have essentially three choices if you're sitting uh, as the Paramount board. You can do nothing, right, and you literally just operate status quo. I think the board recognizes current strategy isn't working. Paramount Plus bleeding, you know, a billion, two billion dollars, not a meaningful player in the streaming wars. So I don't believe they want to move forward with the current strategy. Now, the, they could fire management, totally pivot strategy, follow more of the arms dealer of content strategy that Sony has pursued. Doesn't feel like that's something they really feel comfortable doing, nor do they know exactly who they would bring in. And then the third piece is do a transaction that, while at least in the near term, dilutive to public company shareholders, at least gives long term, you know, there's a long term pitch to the board that I guess makes sense in terms of how they're going to invest, build Paramount Plus into something bigger, use more technology. And I think it's that whole idea. Mm -hmm. that the board is obviously dealing with. And if you have only, you know, if it's really only do nothing or do a transaction that's dilutive, you can understand why they might like the dilutive transaction because the status quo is not working for Paramount and the company is in more and more trouble. And I think, you know, the only reason the stock is above $10 a share was the hope of a transaction, um, ideally a sale to a third party. I think now the question is, is, you know, how cheap will Skydance end up with this asset? Because I think investors are, are finally realizing today that the sale to a third party isn't happening. Yeah, I mean, that has been passed over. Apollo Global Management selling off specific assets or indeed, I mean, Warner Brothers seem to have been dead on arrival, Rich. I'm interested in the technology element you just articulated because that's what David Ellison has some prowess, notably his own father, of course, with Oracle having founded it. But he is someone who wants to lean into tech. What could technology bring Paramount? Well, I mean, look, look, look at what Skydance has done on the animation side. I mean, they've been, you know, they went out and hired the creator, uh, one of the key elements of Pixar films, John Lasseter. So John Lasseter, doesn't work for Disney anymore. He left Disney many years ago. He now has a thousand person animation business. And so that obviously there's a lot of technology that goes into animation. John Lasseter's now at Skydance. And they've just, you know, recently announced that their slate of films is moving from Apple TV Plus over to Netflix. And so their first major release that John's had full control over comes out at the end of this year. Obviously, they think they have the next Frozen, but so you you have some really exciting developments on the Skydance side that are content sort of infused with technology that creates long term opportunity. And again, I think if you're sitting at the Paramount board, you're in a tough situation. Stock is down dramatically. I mean, you look at any, you know, you've got the year to date up, but if you look yeah. over the last several years, this has not been a good stock. The management team has made you know, what appears to be critical mistakes by entering the streaming wars, believing they could you know, compete with the Netflixes and the Disneys. They clearly can't. And so now the question is, what do you do? Do you just start shutting things down? Do you fire everyone? Or do you look for a strategic merger that even if it's not yeah. great in the short term financially, gives long term growth potential or at least a story that the board can get comfort with. And I, my guess is the board is getting comfortable with that story being the best alternative. That story still being written as we stand. Rich Greenfield, come back on it soon, we hope, of Light Shed. Great to have some time with you today.
Meanwhile, though, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. You do not want to forget to check out our podcast. So much to be digesting. You can find it on the terminal as well as online on Apple, on Spotify, on iHeart. If you're based here in North America, have fun viewing that eclipse. Stay safe with your eyes. This is Bloomberg Technology. Thank you.